Our next GreenGov 2015 panel will focus on building a sustainable supply chain. Would you please welcome the head of GE's regulatory advocacy, Senior Counsel Michael Fitzpatrick. From Walmart, the Director of Sustainability, Catherine Neby. HP's Global Director for Environment and Living Progress, Nate Hurst. From the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense, the Program Manager for Sustainability and Environmental Technology, David Asillo. And our moderator, a senior principal with Accenture Federal Services, David Stallman. Well, thank you all for, uh, for having us here. Uh, my, again, my name is Dave Stallman, but I know you're not here to talk, to listen to me, so I'll only speak just briefly to, to thank you all for coming, thank the organizers for having us. You know, Accenture's involved in an awful lot of sustainability activities here in the federal government and around the world. We're, we're proud to be part of that and honored to be here today, so thank you very much. Um, but I'm just as honored to be sharing the stage with some uh, uh, esteemed uh, uh, practitioners in sustainability in the private sector as well as the public sector on the stage. We're gonna talk about primarily, uh, again, supply chain, somewhat broadly defined, and there's a lot of things in supply chain that many people don't think about initially when you think, well, gee, supply chain is warehouses, and it's, it's certainly much, much, much more than that. Um, but with that, we'll get right into our, our questions. Um, so the first question I wanted to ask, the, uh, President Obama's executive order talked a lot about, for example, performance measures, using performance measures to, to set targets, manage progress. Um, could you give examples of how your organizations have, have used performance measures to, in supply chain metrics to, to, make progress, to manage progress, make decisions? I think, Nate, you were going to uh, start with that? Sure, I'd be happy to. So we have a saying at HP, um, and we're, as you guys know, one of the largest um, global IT companies in the world, that you can't manage what you don't measure. And so for us, um, we've been on the environmental journey for over 75 years now. Um, our founders believed that corporate citizenship and giving back to the environment and designing for the environment uh, was key to success in the future. And that vision um, is part of the company of who we are, and I am lucky enough to have one of the greatest jobs in, in managing our environmental footprint, capturing all that data from across the company. And by measuring um, our entire footprint, uh, our supply chain, our products, and our operations, we're able to drive value and innovation um, throughout. For us, our operations only make up 5% of our environmental footprint, 41% is tied up in our supply chain, the rest being in our products. And so that supply chain piece and products piece is where we can make a real difference in the world and where we can really drive what we call environmental progress. We also think the next step, um, once you've captured that data, is to set targets. And so we've set aggressive targets in each um, of those areas of our footprint. We have a 20% reduction um, in our operations by 2020 of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we most recently set a target of 40% reduction across our product portfolio uh, by 2020 and have set a 20% um, reduction across our first tier um, suppliers. So setting those targets has allowed um, each of those parts of the business to really drive towards something. And we've seen some amazing innovations um, come from that now that we have those metrics in place. Right, set targets for people and they, they step up and respond. Catherine, I think you were also going to have some sure. things from Walmart. Sure, um, well, at Walmart we began our sustainability journey about <clears throat> 10 years ago. We're coming up on our, our, our anniversary and we set uh, three goals when it came to sustainability 10 years ago. The first was a commitment to 100% renewable energy. The second was a commitment to zero waste. And the third was a commitment to uh, sell products that sustain people and planet. Uh, and that one is particularly important and relevant to the panel today because we know that 90% of the environmental impact that we at Walmart have is within our supply chain. And so it's there that we can really exert the most uh, influence uh, to drive real substantive change. Um, one of the things that I always have a little bit of a hard time with at Walmart is sort of understanding the scale that, that we operate at. I mean, we're, we're Fortune One, um, but that's sort of, it's an arbitrary number in, in some respects. And so one of the, the metrics that I find useful in informing scale and sort of thinking through supply chain is that we sell 32 pounds of bananas a second. 
Um, it's a lot of bananas. Uh, so when we have an opportunity to work with our suppliers and within our supply chain on key issues, we have real opportunity to get at scale pretty rapidly. Um, the way that we've approached that is uh, through something we call the sustainability index. And what the index does is um, very systematically and scientifically, it identifies what are the key performance issues, the key sustainability challenges associated with uh, the vast majority of products that we sell, the categories that we sell. As you can imagine, the key sustainability issues associated with cell phones is very different from tissue paper. And so this information helps us understand where is there opportunity for us to work with our buyers and with our suppliers that sell very specific categories. How do we find the areas for improvement and for opportunity? Um, we, we benchmark all of our suppliers against the sustainability index to evaluate their performance, to have conversations with them about where are their opportunities to go further and faster. But the index, when you sort of take a step back, also really allows us to understand where there are sort of opportunities in aggregate for us to really prioritize as a sustainability team and as a business to really see the kind of scale and the kind of change that um, is transformative, not just to Walmart, but to the world. Um, and two areas, and, and I think I'll talk about it a little bit later, um, which we've prioritized are factory energy efficiency in China. Um, and then also fertilizer use within our supply chain on climate smart ag. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, anybody else have anything to add on, on the first point there? Um, sure. Yep. Okay. So uh, I just wanted to comment on our uh, internal performance and a little bit on supply chain before we move uh, downstream. Uh, this is the 10 year anniversary of Eco Imagination, which is a, a huge initiative at General Electric. Um, it is promoted heavily by um, the chairman and it's really become embedded in the culture of the company over the last decade. And we have set some uh, important benchmarks for ourselves uh, over the last 10 years in terms of, of, of goals. Uh, we recently took stock of that and uh, as a company we had reduced greenhouse gas by uh, emissions by 31%, fresh water use by 42%, and invested $15 billion in research and development around sustainable products. Uh, we set uh, a new set of targets for 2020, which is to now increase uh, by 20% the emissions and freshwater uh, reductions uh, for the company by 2020 and investing another $10 billion uh, in, in R&D. Um, we do similar things up our supply chain. Um, let me just mention one, and then I, I, I think we'll have a, a, a time to talk in a little bit about the downstream uh, impacts. But, Obviously, China, just to pick up on a point that you were making, is a major source of, of, of supplies for GE. And we have partnered with the Institute for Sustainable Communication and set up two independent academies in China, training 17,000 uh, folks in our supply chain at 3,300 suppliers uh, about uh, sustainable practices. Um, we use a similar sustainability index to measure uh, our, uh, the performance of our suppliers, but um, we feel that it, it's important that we're active in training and educating our suppliers so that we can ensure better performance uh, uh, on the index that we use. All right, thank you. And I think it's, what's notable to me in these answers is you know, there's, there's some aggressive targets that have been put out by, uh, by the president, by the administration, but you can see there are you know, large companies that are, that are setting aggressive targets for themselves and, and meeting them, so thank you. Before I go to the next question, we'll also have an opportunity for audience members to ask questions and those on the um, live stream. So please you know, feel free to fill out the cards and, and submit them in and we'll, we'll get them up on stage here. Do um, you mind if I uh, answer that last question too? Oh, sure. Uh, just, I mean, I don't want to be left out. <laughs> but um, you know, frankly, uh, I think the federal family in general has gotten the sustainability targets. And we've been working in this space uh, for a while now, but you know, starting with 13423 back uh, a while ago, and then uh, obviously 13514, Executive Order 13514, really pushed the envelope. But I think, and we've been uh, meeting and trying to meet these goals and metrics for quite some time. I think this new executive order, 13693, is that right? Yeah, well, yeah. There's, a, there's another executive order that's very similar, um, is really going to take us to the supply chain. I think what we as the Department of Defense and probably m many of the other federal agencies are going to start down this path and can learn, I think, from the captains of industry and help you know, develop that partnership. So that's going to be, I think, helpful going forward. Great. 
don't take too big of a breath because I think you're in the next question. Uh, executive order talks a lot about transparency and improving transparency. And at DOD, you've done a lot of work to improve transparency. Can you talk about that a little? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I don't think we have a choice, frankly. I mean, we're a really big organization. I mean, we're, um, you know, we've got 35, uh, 350,000 buildings around the world in 5,000 different locations. Um, we've got about 200,000 uh, non-tactical vehicles, so that's not submarines, tanks, ships. So there's a lot of just the non-tactical fleet. Uh, we got two, over two million full-time employees, both men and women in uniform and civilians, and another million they call reserves and National Guard that are a part of the, of the Department of Defense. So there's about three million employees. So we're a really big group. Um, and we purchase a lot of stuff. Um, we're the uh, largest user of, of energy in the federal government, I think 65% roughly of the federal government's energy use. And um, I think in 2012, our, our spend for buying goods and services was about $360, $365 billion a year. Uh, 2013, it went down somewhat, I think around $315 billion a year. And then this last fiscal year, it was just under $300 billion a year. So we still spend a lot of money. I think the key here is though it's gone down. Our resources have gone down every year. So we have to be transparent to what we are doing and why we're doing it. If we don't internally, we're not gonna get the support of our leadership, of our members, uh, men and women in uniform, and, and the civilians that support the Department of Defense. And so I think by being more transparent and trying to quell some of the myths that may be surrounding sustainability, uh, developing these targets internally to DOD, working with our federal family to try to promulgate those targets uh, across the federal government, and then learning you know, from industry and others on how we can and institute a sustain sustainability ethic across the department is the only way we're gonna be successful. Um, so we try to instill programs and policies and training internal to the department. So I think a lot of our transparency, frankly, is within DOD, because we are so big, we have to get the word out. We have to learn from uh, the folks in men and women in uniform, the civilians to support the department. We also have to be in a position to give them the tools and an understanding of what we are trying to do to meet our sustainability goals, bo both across the sustainability mantra as well as the supply chain and the supply chain uh, ethics. That's great. I think the transparency, I think, uh, also helps with some earlier comments about give people targets and, and let them go. I think it spurs innovation when people really know what, what's trying to happen. And I think uh, even Administrator McCarthy talked about the, the Kaizen and the efforts to let, let people know what you're trying to do and, and how you're doing. That's great. Um, what about other uh, innovative efforts in supply chain purchasing, um, best practice capabilities? We talked a little bit about procurement, but I think, Nate, you had some, some thoughts about the purchasing uh, initiatives you were doing. Yeah, so as part of our procurement process, we have a social and environmental responsibility scorecard, and um, we have similar programs uh, to you guys in terms of being able to train and help those suppliers and educate them as well. Um, we talk to them and work with them as we set this target, uh, as I mentioned previously, this 20% reduction across our supply chain. But this scorecard actually works as a, as a multiplier. So when we're making um, business decisions on who we're going to buy from, we look at the environmental attributes of that supplier. Do they set their own greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals? Are they transparent and report um, out on those? Do they capture their footprint? And you know what are the reporting processes um, that they work with? Do they report into the Carbon Disclosure Project, CDP, um, and uh, share that information with them? And as that multiplier happens, I mean, it's driving real business decisions. And other suppliers um, that maybe are a little further behind are driving you know, change within their own organizations because they see that they're losing business. The other thing um, that it's done is it's driven real value and innovation in, uh, within those suppliers. Um, and that's driven cost out of the system, which we then you know, can pass on those savings um, to you as customers you know, in the federal government. OK. What, is, what have you done internally and externally, primarily with partners and suppliers? We're talking about that a lot, but maybe bring it home here a little bit around operations to make to improve sustainability. How, how do you work with those partners and suppliers more than what you've, you've said already? And I think, uh, Catherine, I think you were going to start there. Sure. So our sustainability index is really uh, an outcropping of a multi-stakeholder initiative run mm -hmm. by the Sustainability Consortium. Um, and the Sustainability Consortium is comprised of, of 
other retailers of um, other companies within our supply chain and outside of our supply chain, and also with key NGO um, partners and subject matter experts, because we know that we need multiple perspectives and multiple um, levels of information to really inform how we identify what are key issues when it comes to sustainability on a category by category level. Um, as, as an outcome of our work with uh, TSC and, and the index, we've identified, as, as I've mentioned, some key areas of opportunity for us within our supply chain. One of them is um, greenhouse gas. Uh, and a key area for us is fertilizer use. Uh, we know that roughly 45% of the cost of, of grain is associated with fertilizer. Um, and we also know that about 50% of that fertilizer is wasted. The, the plants don't actually absorb that nutrient. Um, so for us, being an everyday low cost, everyday low prices type of institution, we look at that and we see both uh, as a, a waste from an environmental and an economic standpoint, and also a real opportunity for us to think about how do we use our supply chain, how do we partner with our suppliers to get down to real world impact on on the ground to, to drive change. And, and we can't do any of this work um, alone and independent as Walmart. We really rely on our, our partners in, in informing the index and also our partners when it comes to, to finding solutions. Uh, one of the initiatives that is an outcome of our fertilizer work is a commitment to 20 million, to removing 20 million metric tons from our supply chain. It's a, a goal that we set in partnership with the Environmental Defense Fund a number of years ago, and we are close to realizing that goal this year, so we're very excited about that. And David, I think you had said some thoughts also on working with suppliers and, and, and how you instill that sustainability mindset into, with them as well. Yeah, sure. I mean, for us, um, being the largest purchaser of goods and services in the federal government, we're, we're the end user. So we often don't have the supply chain uh, ability to really influence the supply chain yet. And I think we're, we're going to start to get in that direction. But we do, at our end, at the, the end user, have the ability to determine if we're going to buy a product or not. And to do so, we look at several things. And I think Secretary Mavis talked about it, too. You know, does it perform? Uh, is it available? And that's a key issue here. I want to talk about supply chain availability. And um, is it cost um, competitive? It doesn't have to be cheaper. And we always talk about price versus cost. And the, the, the mantra I'm trying to push down to the department is it may be a little bit more upfront, but it's going to save us over the life cycle. So we talk about life cycle a lot in DoD. Yet we need to start, I think, living it a little bit more. And, and we're, we're seeing more and more in, in that trend. But working with our suppliers to try to show performance. And to us, the way we can do this is it's a mission imperative. So if we can demonstrate that these end products are better for our mission or save us money or are going to be available long term, because in some cases, if there's some part of the product that may be regulated out of existence, uh, a constituent that's very harmful or toxic that may be a problem, we're not going to be able to use it, and let's say because we're all, all over the world, Europe, because of regulations like REACH, we're going to have a problem getting these products, and that's going to affect our mission. So we need to understand that. Um, in working with our, our, um, the producers of the products and throughout the supply chain, that if we can have this partnership, we're going to have these, these end products available to us to do our jobs going forward. Okay, great. And, and Michael, we talked earlier, you, uh, there's a lot of focus on the upstream side of the supply chain. What about the downstream side? What have you experienced there? Well, so the downstream uh, side of the equation is where GE makes a big impact in terms of sustainability and environmental uh, benefits. You know. Fixing our own internal operations and even improving our supply chain is, uh, is, is table stakes for us. We have to do that. We, we have to establish the bona fides of, of looking inward to ourselves. But where GE really leverages the benefits is through the products and services that it develops and through the customer base. And we've looked at the life cycle benefits of the products and services that we manufacture. And 99% of the environmental benefits of our products come downstream after we've sold them. So whether it's a natural gas powered turbine or a wind turbine or a uh, LNG powered locomotive um, or a efficient jet engine, um, these products over the course of their 20, 30, 40 year life are generating cumulative benefits. Um, the, way, the way we look at this is uh, a heavy dose of research and development. We spend an immense amount of money um, in R&D, we have six global research centers and another 10 or so global technology centers where we're innovating um, ac across the world and working closely with our customers uh, in, in developing these innovations. I think there's three principal uh, value points 
uh, in terms of our downstream um, uh, offerings um, for our customers. Uh, the first is, obviously, they get an economic benefit from it. We have to be realistic here. There has to be um, a value case uh, economically from a commercial standpoint for the customers. That's what they're paying an awful lot of money for. Um, but in addition, uh, there are environmental benefits that come from that because as the machines become more efficient and more efficacious, uh, they yield environmental benefits. And that's significant uh, in a global policy realm in which uh, the U.S. leading, and I think nobody is a better spokesperson for that than Administrator McCarthy, who we just heard, uh, is, is leading the way uh, towards new policies that are requiring um, uh, more and more uh, environmentally friendly um, operations um, and, and, and products. So there's, there's three sets of benefits, and one of them is closely linked to what you all in government do to keep the environment and ourselves safe. Let, let me finish by just pointing out um, a, few of, a few examples, a few real world examples of, 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 of these, and I'll just pick um, two. Um, the first is in the uh, rail context where we spent $300 million developing a tier four locomotive. That's the new emission standard from EPA. We were really the only company that jumped on that and did it, and as a result, we were the only one that was ready to move in January 1 of this year when that rule went into effect. So needless to say, we're sold out for the next two years uh, from the freight rail companies. It was a good, forward-looking investment, and you're cutting NOx and PM emissions by 70 to 80 percent over the last generation of, of lo locomotive. And, and, and the second I'll talk about is um, uh, the last mile project in North Dakota that is involved in, in fracking uh, light uh, oil. Um, all of the associated gas with pulling that oil out of the ground in North Dakota is being burnt off. It's being flared because there's no pipeline system to move it to market. That is product that's being lost. With Stat Oil and a company called Ferris, we designed a system that allows the producers to compress the gas okay, it, through uh, technology that we make, load it into trucks that Ferris runs, and ship it the last mile, that's the name of it, to a pipeline system or to a transportation node. So in that way, we're protecting the environment, all those CO2 emissions, and we're preserving a product for our customers that's of value to them. Okay, no, thank you. So I'm going to uh, ask a couple of the audience questions, uh, and so please, please continue to have those come on in. Um, and you talked a lot about what, I guess, many of you have talked about how you work with your suppliers. Well, what is it like as a supplier? Um, how, is, how, has federal government, how have federal government efforts on sustainability and sustainable supply chain affected your businesses and how you, you supply the government or, or supply others because the government has said so? Sure. I get, I'm happy to jump in here. I mean, I, <clears throat> I think it's, uh, we learn a lot from our customers and they, they help drive innovation. Um, so setting, having government targets in the environmental sustainability space um, is fantastic news for us, HP, because we too are doing that and we're already trying to innovate and think ahead, um, you know, 10 years into the future of what that next product might be. And so the fact that more and more people across the federal government, one of our most important customers, are, are thinking with that mindset. I mean, business as usual is no longer an option. We have data you know, following us everywhere we go in devices, and that takes energy right, to run those data centers. Um, and we simply don't have enough you know, energy sources for that, so we have to think outside the box. One, how do we create data, um, data centers that are state-of-the-art, energy efficient, you know, utilize um, renewable sources of energy, um, and are using less electricity? So we have, we have now created um, a 100% a super cooling uh, called eight, Apollo 8000, which is a, uh, a server that cools itself. And we're, we're using that with the National Renewable Energy Lab as an example. Um, they've implemented that and told us that they saved just in one year a million dollars. So we, we want to do more of that um, and, and create with the government and to help them meet their needs and their targets. So um, for us, it's a it's frankly a partnership. And even on, on the private sector side as well, I mean, we're a big supplier um, to Walmart. And Walmart will not purchase you know, from you if you don't report into things like the Carbon Disclosure Project and set these targets and perform well. Um, so it's important for our business, 
you know, to hit those thresholds. I'm proud to say we, we, we got an A for performance in 100 out of 100 um, in CDP this year. So uh, we continue to strive and to stay at that level, we know we have to continue to innovate and push forward. Any other? No. Okay. Um, another question from the audience. Uh, can do you, not to put you on the spot, but, <laughs> but Dave at DMD, DOD and Catherine at Walmart, uh, can you discuss what you're doing related to real-time energy monitoring and whether this flows into the supply chain sustainability work? Sure. Well, um, I'm not really the energy czar for our office, but there is, there is energy monitoring going on and we're talking about metering and some of my counterparts in the military departments could probably answer that question a little bit better than me, but I believe when we do start to get the data, and this is the kind of the key for us in DUD, we're trying not to make just decisions just to make a decision. We're trying to actually have real data. And if you look at my boss's boss, the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics, Mr. Kendall, he is very, very, very data centric. So what I think we need to do in the Department of Defense is to have real time data, whether it's through metering or some other mechanism to give us the information we need to make these decisions. And then if it lends itself to a point where we can move into supply chain or some other kind of sustainability effort, I think then we can work with industry like Walmart or others to help us achieve our goals. So that's it. Yeah. Likewise, I'm not the energy czar at Walmart, so I can't exactly speak to that question. Um, but we do rely on real-time data all the time, and we've got one of the most sophisticated supply chains out there. And so we're always looking at where, what are the market signals, what are the, the market levers, and what is happening in real time to help inform our strategy and our direction. Um, when it comes to energy, we are, I, th I think, at 26% renewable energy. As of last, last year, we procured about 3 billion kilowatt hours in 2014 of renewable energy. Um, so we really do look at where is there opportunity domestically and internationally to secure renewable energy and how do we sort of, for lack of a better word, point it towards our stores so that we have some, some assurance that uh, the energy that we're purchasing that's renewable is going to support our stores. Um, an area that we do look at is um, it relates to severe weather and storm events. We tend to be one of the first stop shops when it comes to uh, communities afflicted by disaster. Um, and so one of the things that we use a lot of sophisticated information around is what is happening with, with, with weather, with storms, with snow, with ice, et cetera, so that we can really understand where do we need to think about um, stocking up, stocking down, and where do we want to think about arranging our logistics and our fleet so that we can be there to, to support communities potentially in need. And related to that, where do we think about um, uh, grid power in a, in a different way and, and how we're securing it and where it's coming from so that we can be prepared to be resilient in the event of, of challenging circumstances. Great. And Michael, you yeah, So David, I, I th it's a great question. And I was going to take it and maybe just pivot to another issue that I know we were going to talk about, which is, which is the future. Because it's a question about big data and about real-time monitoring. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've, I've talked a little bit about the efficiencies embedded in these very sophisticated industrial machines, which are really basically computers that also do other things now. And the, when, when we look at the future, and I know HP and others are, are, are looking at exactly the same way, the next wave of sustainability is going to be built around big data and analytics. It's built around the terabytes of information that are thrown off every minute, every hour by jet engines, by MRI machines, by wind turbines, um, and the crunching, the aggregation and the crunching and the movement of that data around the world is going to yield um, small incremental efficiencies, but leveraged across the entire industry are going to be huge benefits in terms of cost savings and emissions. Um, GE has started a software center in San Ramon, California several years ago. We now have 1,200 engineers there. We're becoming a software company. And they're developing the next three generations of predictive software that are going to allow machines to anticipate um, anomalies, to operate more efficiently in real time, and save billions of dollars and avoid accidents. And just one, one example is we now have software that allows um, both real-time monitoring and control from a remote site of an entire wind farm, but in the next generation, actual 
self-monitoring between wind turbines in the wind farm to adjust themselves to operate most effectively. So if the wind conditions change and one turbine is not operating most efficiently, but there's another turbine nearby that is, the data will quickly analyze what the features are, characteristics of the optimal turbine, and then fix the operations on the less optimal turbine. That is the kind of um, leveraging of big data that's coming, and it's very, very exciting. So thank you. And I think to maybe to, to play off the, uh, the future, I think there's a wide range of people in the audience today. Uh, some organizations are right there really leading edge, waiting for the future to come. Others, by a question here, are saying, OK, where do I start? So if you're talking to somebody who is just start, you know, just as a result of this conference, saying, gee, I need to start thinking about supply, supply chain sustainability, where do I start as an organization? What do they need to get right first? Anybody? I mean, I'll just go back to the, sorry, again, the, the opening remark I made. I mean, we, we were on this journey, and I know it's daunting. Um, I would say you don't, you can't manage what you don't measure, so you have to start by, by measuring and reaching out and, and collecting that data. And then there certainly are technology companies that can help you organize that and do the data analytics in a way um, that we've already been through this with our own customers. And so, you know, go to the experts. But I, I think that's probably the first step is actually getting the data um, and not being afraid to make that ask. Because one of the things you'll find is once you understand the data better, you're going to be able to drive these efficiencies. Yeah. And in some cases, it may seem small, and you're going to have that initial conversation. And like, well, why would that make a difference? But when you look across mm -hmm. you know, um, the scale and the value chain, you start to realize, wow, OK, that was incremental. We can, have, we can have more and more of those. One of the things we did with one of our servers is we started applying it to our own um, websites, hp.com. And we found that we drove. So, many, so much cost in, in greenhouse gas out of the system that we can now run HP.com on the equivalent of 12 light bulbs. I mean, this wouldn't have happened if we wouldn't have, have started with looking at where our, our data is and what the data is telling us. I, yeah, I would, I would add, I, I completely agree with Nate's point. Um, I would add a couple of things. The, the first is you're not necessarily, it, while it may be new to you, this is not new work to a lot of people that have already been working on these topics for a long time. I've talked a lot about the sustainability index. It is not an exclusive club limited to Walmart. You know, we would, we would encourage anyone who's interested in learning more about purchasing decision priorities, key issues, um, to, to explore with the sustainability consortium how they could potentially leverage some of that information and inform some of their work. Um, there are a number of other systems and platforms out there that you can tap into to help inform and prioritize your work. Um, and I, you know, my sense is that the market would really welcome that. Um, what sometimes happens in sustainability is everyone has a slightly different um, lens on what actually sustainability means. And as a result, you have 15 different signals, some of which are more powerful than others, going into the market to inform what, you know, what the customer is asking for. In some cases, that makes sense. In other cases, it makes no sense. So where can we have some convergence in terms of what are we asking people to really do, and how are we helping them set prioritize, priorities, and how are we setting them ourselves? I think sort of taking another, another um, pass at the question, uh, whenever we're thinking about prioritization, the two questions we always ask ourselves are, um, what are we big to? I mean, we're Walmart, so we're big to a lot of things. But where, where do we really have the opportunity to make meaningful impact? And then also, what's big to us? Because it may be that something out there is really, really important to us that we maybe don't have on our radar screen. So those are, those are two good questions to get started. Well, I was going to say, first putting a pitch in for you, one thing they could do is hire Accenture, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> uh, and just to respond to a point that Nate made, um, just the power of small, we call it the power of 1%. Um, we did an analysis, and if um, global industrial energy consumption increased 2% in efficiency year over year instead of 1%, by 2030, you would save 20, excuse me, 70 quadrillion BTUs of energy per year. These are extraordinary numbers just from small incremental increases 
in, 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 in efficiency. One idea that we've used that might be applicable to the questioner's scenario, but also to folks in government, um, is something we call the treasure hunt. And it, it's built off of a, um, a Kaizen process um, started by Toyota. I think Administrator McCarthy also mentioned that at EPA they've got some Kaizen-inspired processes. And what, what we do here, it, it's really, it's, it's not that complicated. Um, we send in a special team of, of experts to a site, so to one of our in, industrial sites, for example, and we work with the on-site employees um, to shut the entire site down. We go down to complete um, black, non-operational mode, and then we slowly reactivate the site piece by piece by piece, and in doing that, we analyze the um, uh, operational um, efficiency of each component and we look for opportunities to make savings and then we prioritize those and then we figure out how to operationalize that. And, and so it's a, it's a very um, deliberate, careful deconstruction and reconstruction of your process and in doing that you, you have the space and the um, I think the um, isolation of, of sub-process to, uh, to identify real opportunities. The last point in that that's real important though is that we work with the employees on the site to identify the opportunities and then ask them to implement them. So we have buy-in from the bottom up. It's very hard I think to go in behaviorally and just tell people what you've de decided they should do. So it's, I think, important to be collaborative in that respect. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from the audience. Uh, what are you doing to eliminate or minimize toxic materials and waste in your supply chain? Anybody? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, there's several things that we're doing. I mean, first of all, you gotta identify where they are. And that's, that's kind of the, the problem right now. We have a very big supply chain. We have a lot of suppliers. We buy a lot of things. We let I don't know, 13 million contracts a year, roughly. Um, so we're trying to identify what those toxic materials and chemicals are. We have a program, an emerging contaminants program, where we have a scan watch action list where we look at chemicals and materials, try to identify where they're being used, whether it's on a weapon system platform, all the way down to you know, consumables that we might buy. And getting, uh, working with various associations like the aerospace industries associations or other entities to try to figure out what and where those are. Until we get our hands on that, it's kind of hard to eliminate or even minimize what those chemicals are. Yet, we do have programs in place where we do identify what those chemicals and materials are. Uh, we use the EC, Emerging Contaminants Program, to try to uh, have action measures or elimination measures to try to get the, the uh, hazardous chemicals and toxic chemicals out of, out of our systems. Yet, um, it's not a uh, cheap proposition. Right? It's not an inexpensive proposition, so we need to, to budget for it appropriately and, and try to come up with alternatives. We have a fairly robust research development test and evaluation program, which we're always looking for alternative chemicals and materials um, funded from throughout the you know, congressionally man mandated program and funded uh, and appropriated funds. And those are some of the activities that we're, we're engaged okay. in. Okay. Shane, I'm going to move on to the last one. We're running, uh, running toward the end here. I want to make sure we get this, this question in at least. Um, we've talked a lot about what your companies are doing, uh, talking to a government audience. Um, and recognizing sometimes things are different, but sometimes things aren't as different as sometimes they make the people make them out to be. What are your recommendations for the government, for the audience, of what they can do or, should, or where they should start uh, regarding sustainable supply chain? Well, I, I mentioned one already. Maybe I, I sort of jumped ahead of the question, uh, which is the treasure hunt. I, I would only also add that, um, and I think some of the government speakers today have already touched on this, the government itself is, has access to vast amounts of data, and I don't mean um, your phone records. I mean uh, <laughs> data that, that, that is being generated by your operations, right, and your supply chain's operations and the data centers. And so I would, um, I, I, I think government should do the same thing we're doing at GE for our own operations and for our customers' operations, and that is look for ways to harness and analyze that data to lean out um, your, your operations, your process. I think that's, um, that's sitting there as a big opportunity. Yeah, and I would just echo the point that Catherine made. You're, you're not at this alone, so don't be afraid um, to come ask you know, folks on the stage, others that have, have been on this journey. Um, 
because we're all in this together. I mean, it's an interconnected world now. And uh, those that, you know, may be a little farther along, there's a lot of learnings there. And there's a lot to learn for us as a technology company from you, the customer, as well, so we can improve our own products and efficiencies in our own supply chain. Well, I, I can think of no better place to end a, a sustainability discussion than we're all in this together. So, uh, <laughs> Michael, Catherine, Nate, and David, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the great questions that were asked. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>